So this morning we're looking at one of the most well-known prophecies of Jesus Christ in the Bible. It was a prophecy um, by the prophet Isaiah. He was a man called of God to speak to the people of God, the children of Judah. He lived and he wrote some 700 years before the life of Jesus. It's quite remarkable the prophecy that he gives us and the detail that he gives us. So if you want to turn with me to Isaiah 53. Derek Thomas and John Calvin both agree, I agree with them, that the, um, the chapter division for this is possibly poorly selected. <clears throat> um, they both propose that it should have been at the end of verse 12, and the beginning of verse 13 of chapter 22. So let's read from there. So chapter 22 of Isaiah, sorry, 52 of Isaiah, <clears throat> verse 13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So he shall sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what had not been told them, they shall see. And what they had not heard, they shall consider. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs, he has carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him, stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned, every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and in the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labour of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge... My righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. We're going to look at this um, passage under four headings. Firstly, the context. Secondly, we're going to look at the Christ, the nature of Christ. Thirdly, the cross. And then the conclusion. So firstly, the context. Without the context of the previous chapters or the context of the history of the world to this point, it's difficult for us to get the full meaning of this passage. So too... If you don't read this in the context of your life and your soul, then it will have little application to you. So let's look firstly and briefly at the context in this book and in the history of the world. The nation of Judah, God's special people, they are in strife. Barry Webb highlights that the previous chapters 
have repeatedly drawn attention to the fact that there is endemic sinfulness in the nation. Judah has sinned. The surrounding nations have sinned. The whole world has sinned against God. And Judah, despite receiving great and unique blessing from God, find themselves in deep sin. They've forgotten God. They've rejected him. And they've put him aside to serve their own desires, to pursue their own pleasures. Look with me briefly at the first part of Isaiah. This sort of sets the scene a little bit. Isaiah chapter 1, starting verse 2. Hear, O heavens, give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master. But Israel does not know. My people do not consider. Alas, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, children who are corrupters. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backward. Why should you be stricken again? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick. From the heart, sorry, and the whole heart faints. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores that have not been closed or bound, nor soothed with ointment. This is a description of the nation of Judah. Horrible, horrible situation they find themselves in. Horrible sin against God, and God's judgment is looming down on them. Furthermore, the context of this book, the first, um, the first 39 chapters of the prophecy declare this judgment. They judge the children of Judah, they judge the nations around, they judge the whole world for the sin, the immorality, the idolatry before God. It points out that God is a God of justice and he cannot tolerate their rebellion. He is holy and he requires them to be holy. They have exchanged their holiness for sinfulness. They've worshipped false gods. They've rejected the true God. However, at the end of the book, the, f- the last 27 chapters, they declare hope. They reveal this message of a Messiah. Hope of a saviour. One who would come and redeem God's people. One who would come and reconcile them to God again. <coughs> So that's where we find ourselves, in the middle of these last chapters. And this chapter here, Isaiah bursts out and just lets it all out, gives us a full description of who this Messiah is going to be and what it's going to be like. This context is not too dissimilar to ourselves. See, God created the whole universe, created all that's in it. He created it perfect, without sin, without blemish. And in it he created mankind. He gave us a special and unique gift. He made us in his own image. And with that, he gave us a soul that cannot die, a free will to exercise our own discernment and judgment. And he gave us a conscience, an inner awareness of what is right and wrong. And each of us have that. There's three parts to our character that come that we've inherited from being made in his likeness. Despite that, mankind has decided to exercise his free will and rejected the very God that created him. We've decided it would be more fun to go against the conscience that he gave us. We've chosen to do the wrong thing instead of right. We've chosen to do evil instead of good. We have sought to make ourselves more important than God and make ourselves the master of our own destiny, disregarding the sovereign God who rules over the whole universe. We've chosen to reject God, ignore him. We despise the very idea of him. We've chosen to suppress the inner knowledge that we have of God. Our conscience testifies to the fact that there is a God and yet we've chosen to reject it. We've chosen to reject God. We are all guilty. And I put it to you today that you are a sinner. Not a very popular thought. Not a very popular idea. You are a sinner. 
the Bible says you are. Some of you may say, sin? What? No, I'm not a sinner. I'm not perfect, but I'm not a sinner. I haven't murdered anyone. I haven't raped anyone. I don't steal. Some of you may say, yeah, I have sinned. I've got a a checkered history. But I'm a good person now. And all the good that I've done outweighs the bad. Surely I've made up for it. Surely God wouldn't punish me, a good person like me. God summarises the law. He's written it in our conscience and he's written it in the word of God. He summarises it in Exodus chapter 20. The Ten Commandments. We've all heard of them. Let's look at them. You shall have no other gods before me. Have you had anything? Have you put anything in greater, uh, of greater importance to God in your life? You shall, so you shall not have any graven image. You shall not bow down to it or worship it. Do you worship God and God alone? Or are your loyalties divided? Is your time and your effort divided, among other things? Or is God truly the focus of your life? You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. How do you use your Sundays? Is it holy? Is the whole day God focused? Honour your father and your mother. Can you tell me that you respect and honour your parents all the time? You shall not kill. God says if you've hated another person in your heart, you are guilty of murder. You shall not commit adultery. God says if you've lusted after another person, then you are guilty of adultery. Are you innocent of this? You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. We've all lied. Told a white lie. Tried to deceive someone. We've held the truth when it's important. You shall not covet. Can you say you're innocent of being envious or jealous or desiring something that is someone else's or something you can't have? The Bible says that if you failed in one of these things, then you failed in all of them. You are guilty of all of them. 1 John 1, 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Romans 3, verse 10. There is none who is righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have all become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Romans 3.23 For all have sinned, sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of us can escape it. We are all sinners. And God in his perfection cannot tolerate our defiance. He cannot bear our guilt. He cannot ignore your sin. You've rejected him and he cannot simply accept you back. He's a God of justice and he demands justice. And in accordance with his justice, we are all sentenced sentenced to eventual death of our body and the punishment of our souls by an eternity of hell, fire and torment. Romans 6 23, for the wages of sin is death. Isaiah 48, 22, there is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. Revelation 21, verse 8, but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers, the sorcerers and idolaters and liars, all have their part in the lake burning with fire and brimstone, that is hell. You are guilty. And the day of your trial is coming. On the day that you die, your soul will be presented before Almighty God. You'll be tried and you'll be found guilty. And you'll be sentenced to this punishment, an eternity of hell, by the God who created you perfect. What will you say on that day? What defence will you give? This is your destiny. So this is your context. This is the context of your life and your soul. And that's the context that I want to consider this chapter. So we're going to see the identity of the Christ, the Messiah, the Saviour, 
the servant, as Isaiah keeps mentioning in, the, in this book, the servant who will redeem God's people. So let's look at that. My second point, the Christ. In the chapters leading up to this, the prophet has given several little sneak peeks as to who this Messiah might be, who this servant is, this great servant that's going to redeem his people. He's called him the servant. And there's several songs written in the book about the servant. And we get to this chapter and we see him revealed in great detail. So let's look through this chapter and find out who this servant is, who this Messiah is, the Redeemer. What can we find out about him? First of all, we see that he will be a servant sent by God. Verse 13 of chapter 52. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. It's referring to Jesus. And Jesus gives testimony to this. In John 4, 34, Jesus said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work, clearly referring to God the Father in heaven. John 6, 38, For I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. John 7, 33, Jesus said to them, A little while I'm with you, and then I go to him who sent me. Philippians 2, 5-8, Jesus, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and taking on the form of a servant. Coming in the likeness of men and being in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. We see here the servant sent <coughs> by God himself. Secondly, we see that he is exalted extolled and very high. Quite a contrast to this servant image, isn't it? Who gets this sort of title? A king. And Jesus is indeed the king. We read there before, he came from heaven. That was his origin. King in heaven. And Revelation bears witness to Jesus, says, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings. That is his title. Though a servant, he is king. And Jesus gave up his exalted position in heaven, as we read before. And he says in John 6, 38, For I came down from heaven. He was exalted. He was extolled. He was very high. What's more, Jesus was and is God himself. The Son of God. Now this is a complex, difficult thing for us to comprehend. Our puny human brains can't really understand it. But God tells us that he is a trinity. Three persons, one God. And in this Jesus says that he is one of the persons of God. The son of God. And so he is equal to God. He is God himself. Matthew 26, 63. The high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell me if you are the Christ the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, It is as you said. Jesus testifies clearly to the fact that he is God, the Son of God. And yet despite that, we see here, verse 2 of chapter 53, uh, 53, it says, He has no form or comeliness, that is majesty. There is no beauty that we should desire him. This is the third characteristic of the Messiah. He's an ordinary man. Throughout Jesus' life, people were constantly surprised at the skill which he had in speaking, his knowledge of the Bible, his understanding of human behaviour and human nature. He was often referred to as the carpenter's son or the boy from Nazareth. John 1, 36. Can any good come out of Nazareth? Nazareth is like Sydney's Bankstown or Liverpool, can any good come out of Nazareth? No one was expecting it. No one was expecting anything good to come from him. He was an average guy, an ordinary man. Nothing about his appearance, nothing about his earthly origins made him respectable, honourable or attractive. 
or to stand out. He was an ordinary man from a blue-collar family, brought up in a home that struggled to make ends meet. He was a tradie, a carpenter. He wasn't a uni graduate. He wasn't a model. He wasn't a local sports hero. He wasn't a musician. He wasn't even a good-looking guy. Derek Thomas points out he was unattractive to look at. And it declares that in our passage. There was no form of comeliness. When we see him, there was no beauty that we should desire him. One of my mates at work, he calls me Jesus. He says I look like him. Apparently Jesus had dreadlocks. Um, I, my answer to him is, you know, if you're going to compare me to Jesus, then appearance is about as far as you're going to get. I'm not much to look at. That's fine. You can say that about me. But beyond that, we're like chalk and cheese. Jesus is perfect, and I'm not. Jesus is king of the universe, and I'm just a little human scurrying around on the face of this little planet. But see, that's exactly the point. Jesus didn't come as a supermodel or a rock star. He didn't come to the rich and famous. He didn't come as a superhero to hang out with those who are really good people. To hang out with those who did great things for humanity. He came as an average, not much to look at guy. An average human. He came as an average man for the average human. He came as a less than average man for the less than average human. Jesus used to hang out with tax collectors and sinners, it says. These were the thugs, the prostitutes, the drug addicts. And Jesus hung out with them. One time, some pious religious guys came up. They thought they were better than everyone else because they were good. They came to Jesus and said, Why do you hang out with the riffraff of society? Why do you hang out with these guys? Matthew 9, 11 to 13 um, speaks of this. And his answer is, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus came for sinners. He came for the outcasts. He came for the lost causes. He came for sinners like you and me. He came for the worst of us. And he hung out with the worst of us. Can you see the contrast between the almighty king of the universe and a mere man on earth hanging out with the riffraff of society? Jesus became a nobody on earth so that he could relate to the nobodies. He became an average man to relate to average humans. The fourth thing we see is a man of sorrows. Jesus' life was full of hardship, sorrow, pain, disappointment, rejection, loneliness. He lived a life of despair, of poverty, hunger. He didn't live a comfortable life. The king of the universe came and lived in poverty. He didn't have good friends that stuck by him the whole time. People didn't listen to him when he, when he spoke to them. And when he did speak, they misquoted him. They had twisted his words. They all loved him one minute and they wanted to kill him the next. He was poor, hungry, homeless. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. said he was an average man, but he wasn't. For we see in verse 9, he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. He was perfect. He did stand out. He wasn't just an average man. He was perfect. At Jesus' trial before the Jewish leaders and the Roman leaders, he was found innocent. They wanted to kill him. He was found Innocent And Pilate, the Roman leader, pleads for him. He says, indeed, so this is in Luke 23, indeed, having examined this man in your presence, I have found no fault in this man concerning those things which you, of which you have accused him. And John records Pilate saying, I find no fault in him at all. He was innocent. He was not a sinner like you and me. And in that he stood out. In spite of his upbringing, in spite of his circumstances, 
his surroundings, his sufferings, we find Jesus a good, decent man, perfect, without sin, pure, innocent before God. This is the character of the servant, the servant of God who would redeem God's people. This is the character of Jesus who came to redeem us. So my fourth point, sorry, the third point, the cross. Jesus died by crucifixion. Crucifixion was a horrible way to die. It had been perfected over many centuries. The Romans really perfected it. The aim of it was to inflict the most painful and enduring, excruciating death. The worst method of execution. It was such a painful way to die that they even invented a new word to describe its agony. The word excruciating means of the cross. We haven't got time to go into all the details of the cross and the agony of it. We read it before in the book of Mark. Um, I encourage you to look through the other um, gospel accounts, Matthew, Luke and John as well. Um, if you look on your handout, I think I've listed there the, the references for those accounts. I encourage you later to look through them and look at the suffering that Christ went through. But we haven't got time to go through it here. You can also bring your attention. I've put on your handout a little um, web address. It's a link to a sermon by Mark Driscoll, um, an incredible sermon that I, I've listened to a few times. Um, it's called, uh, what's it called? What did Jesus accomplish on the cross, I think. Um, an outstanding sermon, amazing. I encourage you all to listen to that. It um, sheds new light on the suffering of Christ on the cross. However, as I said, we read it in Mark before. Matthew Henry describes Jesus as being disfigured beyond recognition through the process of his scourging and crucifixion. Jesus was a bloody mess. He had bruises, cuts, gashes all over him. The skin was torn from him. He had exposed flesh. His disfigured, was then, his disfigured body was then stripped naked and nailed to a cross, put up high for all to see, and there he slowly died a death of, by asphyxiation on the cross. Six long hours dying. Driscoll says that if we were to see him, we would be revolted by the look, at him, look of him. Some of us would vomit at the sight of him. <clears throat> Verse 3. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. Driscoll says if we were to see him, we would have looked at him and said, Even God hates that man. Even God hates that man. Verse 4. We esteemed him smitten by God and afflicted. So that's what he suffered. But how did this achieve reconciliation for sinners? How was this servant king achieving the redemption for God's people by dying? <clears throat> by poetic repetition, we see it throughout this whole chapter. Let's work through it. 13 times he says it. Verse 4. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. You make his soul an offering for sin. Whose sin? He had none. For our sin. Verse 11. He shall bear their iniquities. Verse 12, he was numbered with the transgressors. That's you and me. He bore the sins of many and he made intercession for the transgressors. Thirteen times you have it revealed to us. Let me explain it to you. We've already done all the legwork here leading up to this. We've seen that we are sinners, all guilty before God. Justice has sentenced us to physical death and eternity of soul torment in hell. Jesus, king over, the, king over all the universe, 
God himself became a man, lived as a man, like us, yet without sin. He was innocent and pure. He was accused by the Jews of sin, high treason, sentenced by the Roman governor to be tortured and to death by crucifixion. What a grave injustice. Martin Luther calls this the great exchange. John Calvin refers to Jesus as the substitute. This is how it works. Jesus, not deserving of death and hell, willingly suffered the torment of it on the cross in the place of sinners. He exchanged his perfection for our sin. He substituted his life and his soul for ours. He suffered physical death and the torment of hell in our place. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 For he that is God made him Jesus who knew no sin to become sin that we might become the righteousness of God. Simple exchange. He became sin. Mark Driscoll speaks of this in the most brutal of terms. He says that if, Christ, if Jesus died for you, he became your sin. That means that if you're a murderer, on the cross, Christ became a murderer. If you're a rapist, Christ became a rapist. If you're a thief, he became a thief. If you're a prostitute, Jesus became a prostitute. If you're a glutton, he became a glutton. He became all of your sin on the cross. And it killed him. As Jesus was dying on the cross, he bore all the sins of all God's people. And it crushed him to death. Galatians 3 verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become cursed for us. Isaiah 48 verse 9. For my name's sake I will defer my anger, and for my praise I will restrain it from you, so that I do not cut you off. Where was he deferring his anger? From sinners unto Jesus. So that I do not cut you off. And yet look in our passage what he says. In verse 8. For he was cut off from the land of the living. God reserved that cutting off for Christ and let us go free. In verse 10 we see that the justice that God demands was satisfied. It says there, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you see, sorry, when, when you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see the labour of his soul and be satisfied. Yet it pleased God to put Jesus to death. It pleased God to bruise Jesus. God put Jesus to grief. God made his soul an offering for sin. God shall see the labour of his soul and be satisfied. We read in our passage in Mark, as Jesus was dying on the cross, what did he call out? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? His own dad forsaking him while he bore our sins. The forsake, he forsook Jesus instead of us. So is this some sadistic God that takes evil pleasure in watching his beloved son in agony, dying on the cross. No, this is a God of love. A God whose love for his people is so, so great that he would even let his son die in such a way in order to bring reconciliation between himself and his people. This is his love. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes on him will not perish, but have eternal life. 
So we come to the last point, the conclusion. So here's the big question. Who crucified Christ? Who crucified the king? Was it the Jewish leaders who, who falsely testified against him? Was it the, the Roman governor that sen sentenced him to death? Was it the centurion standing by executing the sentence? Was it God, the Father, who had him killed for our sake? Or was it you? Was it your sin that nailed Jesus to the cross? Was it your sin that he had to bear while he died an excruciating death? Today, there is a free offer. A free offer for all of you. To receive this gift of reconciliation. To receive Jesus' redemption for you. To make that exchange. You for Jesus. Your sin for his righteousness. Do you want to have Jesus as your substitute in death? Here's what you have to do. You have to admit that you are a sinner and in need of a saviour. Romans 6.23 For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You have to abandon your self-effort and realise that you cannot be saved by your own works. Acts, Acts 16.31 Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Believe. You have to accept freely Christ's payment for your sins required of the Father. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You need to acknowledge Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Saviour. Acts 4.12 Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven by, to which mankind may be saved. Who crucified the king? Was it you? 